Welcome everybody to Surprised by Art with Luke and Kirk, where we explore the surprises inherent in great works of art. I'm Kirk and I choose a poem. And my name is Luke and I'm going to choose a painting for you, Kirk. Great. Yes. And we're going to surprise each other. And this is based on audience members. So you guys over at the group Surprised by Art on Facebook voted for a topic And then we chose a work of art, a painting, a poem to surprise each other and you with. And you're going to, you know, be able to explore this with us. So, Luke, why don't you tell us a little bit about this topic and, you know, get us rolling here? Well, it sounds like it was pretty like the vote was was pretty well in hand for childhood wildness. I kind of cheated a little bit just <laughs> because oh, I could, that right? <laughs> I didn't cheat, but Jeremiah said that I cheated. He, I, I, um, he's cause he was like, I don't know. I'm not excited about any of these. I was like, vote for childhood wildness. You won't be, you won't be, uh, you know, let down. And he's like, Oh man, you're cheating. That's not cheating. That's persuasion. <laughs> that's what I said. That's persuasion. And, but he did go and a couple other people went and voted for that one, which well, is the one the Although I liked all the topics. But. Yeah, the second place one, what was it? It was um, Revelation, Secular, Secular Revelation. Secular Revelation. Oh, I love that topic. I hope we yeah. revisit that sometime soon. Yeah, and overcoming... Uh, now, we, we had a little bit of discussion about this topic of childhood wildness because initially we were going towards boy... Boyhood tempestuousness. Boyhood tempestuousness. Was the first iteration. Got it. Yeah. Okay, childhood wildness. And I think m- my artwork my painting changed because of that change in topic but i think it would be something i'd choose for either one yeah but i'm excited to share this painting with you and it's uh it's one that maybe nobody knows about really i saw it in a museum um and i it's been on one of my tours and it's a pretty small painting and it's not very detailed but i think it captures a kind of moment that i've never seen captured in any other artwork but it feels like something that is throughout my childhood and my adulthood a special kind of moment that i i like reliving and remembering and then planning for so i'm excited That's to see what do you think of it yeah, that, that really is interesting. And just for the people listening, you know, we're going to describe it and have other audience members describe it as much as possible. It may be enjoyable for you listening to kind of just listen to it and d- picture it in your mind as we go through it and then look at it. At some point, I really recommend looking at the painting for yourself. It'll be really enjoyable. Um, but if you want to pause at some point before we get into it, you can look at the painting for yourself. But just we we really recommend, and this is Luke's uh, from Luke's, you know, rules. Not really a rule, but a helpful hint that I enjoy and agree with. My rules, real rules, of art, you know, exactly. Yeah, like uh-huh. try not to look at the title of this poem and the or of this painting. Oh, that's true. Before. That, that, that's a rule. That's, that's, that's a rule. hard and fast. It's so, like the so main rule that solidifies all rules. One. Okay. Yeah. So let okay. but let's get into it, man. I'm all looking right. Forward to this. Okay. Sounds good. You want to give it your own title to start with? Yes. I will. Do all that. right. So. And let me share my screen with you. And I'm going to show you this artwork. All right, Kirk, I'm very excited to hear what you think of it. Okay. Um, Wow. So (laughs) what's your quick title? I mean, uh, uh, fearless. All right. Very intrigued. Okay. So Kirk, what do you see? Yeah, so uh, I see. So here's a description, and it's uh, there's a lone tree with only two pieces of uh, greenery on it. Very small, not leaves, but like a teeny little bough, (laughs) like four inches long, and that's it. And it's bare. And then this uh, there's a big rock, uh, like a cliff. Like this is the top of a cliff. And then there is a young girl. I assume this is a young girl. She is in a black and perhaps blue dress and the wind is coming from behind her and pushing it forward very intensely. It looks like, and she's got her feet close together. Her hand is in her dress, kind of like she's trying to keep it down a little bit. And there's like a string of hair that's blowing forward, you know, because the the wind is looking so, um, you know, so intense. And then her hat has been blown off from her head 
and you cannot see her face because she's kind of to the side of you. Uh, although I can kind of see, you know, the side of her face. I just can't really make it out. But, um, and then there's uh, clouds in the sky with just little slivers of blue. And it's very brown colored overall. <laughs> That's the color. I'm uh, Color is not my forte. So, you know, brown is all I can think of. Uh, but it overall feels tinted with brownness. Yeah, that's an interesting color. I'm wondering if that's just a, a matter of the, the color palette, um, of yeah. the materials. But I'm curious, putting that aside, what time of day would you say that this brown makes you think of? Um, dusk. Yeah. Not dawn, yeah. right? It's not dawn. I don't know. I could be wrong, but it doesn't feel like dawn for some reason. Okay. Doesn't I mean like it's not how you would normally draw dawn, I guess. It's it's more like late in the day, I should say. Yeah, perhaps. Perhaps late in the day. Maybe maybe sunsetish. Um, so what sure. is she doing out here? That's a good question. Um I can't tell how old she is. That's the question I want to know. Is she 13 or I mean she looks like she's preteen probably, but right on the cusp of that age. That's my assumption, like 11, 12 years old. And maybe she's up there. Whew. I don't see like, anything that she has that indicates that she's up there. I don't know for like travel. Well, she's got no backpack or anything. Yeah. I mean, my, I mean, my thought is always like play, right? That's that it's play, but it's not exactly. She doesn't look like she's in a playful mood or stance, or and she's standing on the peak of this, um, you know, stony rock, and she looks barefoot. I can't tell if she's actually barefoot, but she looks barefoot. Is she barefoot or does she have like? You know, I, I can see you the back what? of her I, heel. I've gone back and forth. My first impression is that she's barefoot, but I, I perhaps there's a little bit of a heel, but it looks like she she might be barefoot there. That she she what took off her shoes or didn't have shoes and then climbed on top of this jutting rock. And why did she do that? You know what I'm getting the impression of because it's a kid and where she is, is that in the, what we can't see in the outside of this picture is like a group of girls or a boy who dared her to do this. Cause this looks like a daring situation. It totally does. You're making me think of Anne of Green Gables when she um, what climbed the top of the uh, the roof. <laughs> yeah. I, for those of you who are Anne of Green Gables fans, you might remember that. But we don't see anybody else. There's nobody else in this image, at least. She's exactly. by herself. She's by herself, yeah. That's why I'm not sure about that. I mean, maybe she dared herself. Um, you know, but there's no indication that I can see, unless I'm missing something, of why she went up there other than which may be the point other than to do it right like to prove that she can do it it's it's like you know like you see a tree and you want to climb it as a kid that's a very kid thing to do and it's you yeah. know some professionals do that like they see um el capitan it's like i gotta climb that without any straps like what like it's like that kind of thing and it's got that kind of feel to it that she's a daredevil and she has to get up there and maybe she even got up there and she's now a little scared. Like, you know, her feet are together. Um, you know, her, her cheeks almost feel like they're a little puffed. Like she's, you know, holding her breath or something, you know, trying to hold her dress down. Cause this thing is, this wind is pushing her whole dress forward. And if she falls over, I mean, I don't know how far down, but it can't be good if she falls. So let forward. me ask you this, that wind, was it windy when she started climbing up? I don't imagine it was this windy, no. Because I mean that she would have lost her hat already. Like just yeah, climbed. exactly, exactly, right. So she, the wind suddenly, she's up there, climbing to the top of this extra little peak on top of a peak. Yeah, at, and has her feet just together, almost like she's on a diving board. Uh, yeah, she's not bracing them, and then suddenly there's a gush of wind. All right. So what do you think she's thinking to herself as she's up here? What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> like, why am I up here? This is crazy. I, I, I don't think she, it, her head is down. Like I said, her hands are 
trying to keep her dress from, you know, because it's it's flowing forward intensely. So she, and it's showing her the bottom part of her leg. And she's trying to bring it down, not modestly, but just like I can imagine the fabric pushing her forward. Right. Yeah, Which is what she I mean, doesn't like want. Sail is blowing in the wind and you're trying to pull it in. I, I have a little bit of a history with, with on sailboats and you got to you got to push it down. Otherwise, it's going to flare up in your face and all over the place. Yeah. So let me ask you this, Kirk. Is that wind going to push her off? It pushed her hat off her head. Is it going to push her off? I mean, that's that's my fear. I Like, I feel a, a worry for her that it might. So I can't say that it will. Um, I mean, I, I could see that. Interestingly, this tree isn't like swaying. Like the top of it seems like it might be thin. So it's not so intense that it's like knocking over this tree or like bending the the limb itself or anything or the the, uh, the, the trunk itself. And is there anything in her pose or posture that suggests that she's pretty stable there? The fact that one foot isn't in front of the other or behind the other, right? Like if, if you're getting blown, you would probably not have your feet together because that makes you the least able to brace uh -huh. against it. Yeah. Now there's one more detail that I, I didn't really see until I tried to take her pose and that she's bending her knees. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. I see that now. Yeah. She's kind of scooted down a little bit. Yeah. And bent her knees to stabilize herself while the wind is blowing. And even though that hat's flying off and the and the, you can hear the, the dress fabric beating around her, she's 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 gonna be there. And I don't know, it's the wind is suddenly blown, but I'm wondering, do you think she's going to stay there in that position or is she going to start to climb down? Oh, so she's in the process of climbing down, perhaps. I'm wondering. Yeah, like she's about, she's preparing to, you know, maybe like let's set back either that or this is like a particularly uh, windy place and the challenge is to get up there and then sit back or something like that and let the, you know, do it and, you know, like the wind is so intense that you're supposed to let it cushion you. Uh, like a oh, seat. so this is the kind of part of the dare to herself to because that know. wind is going to pick up. That's but a lot you know, to get there from this. You, you already mentioned something about the feet, that they're not apart, that yeah. their heels are together as if she'd be, if she were standing, she'd be standing straight up like an arrow. And then she's just bent down a little bit to brace herself against the wind. Yes. So I'm wondering, maybe she might start climbing down. I mean, that tree is right there. She could turn around. Yeah, but I, those heels and the legs so tightly put together. I'm wondering if she's going to stay there. Yeah, I mean it's it, it feels like she probably just got there, like she just got up there. She stood up and then her hat blew off. Right, like I don't know yeah. if she's been there for ten minutes or twenty minutes, and and you know I don't again I'm not 100 percent sure why she got there. Maybe she just wanted the view too. Like it's a part, it's supposed to have oh, the best yeah. view, right? Like Absolutely. Right. That's, um, that, that's, you know, one reason to climb up things is to challenge yourself. And the other is that you don't get a view like that anywhere else. And so maybe she's covered with hills everywhere and she can't see, but this particular hilltop, this little rocky Alka or, um, you know, peak can overlook the entire valley around her. And that's what she's trying to do. Or that's what she was doing. And then her hat came off, and maybe that made her scared, and so she's starting to climb down now. All right. She wasn't expecting so I, that. I like that summary. So the, I think a key question is whether or not she's expecting that wind to come, and maybe we can maybe the title will shed some light on that. But before we do that, I'd like to compare it and have you look at another okay. artwork that's very similar to this one that's a lot more famous, and it's called The Wanderer by Kaspar David Friedrich. The mm -hmm. Wanderer. And have you seen this one before, Kirk? Oh, yeah. So could you describe it briefly and then yeah. we'll compare it like the different moment? Yeah. So I, it's um, a dap, I, I'm going to call him dapper gentleman with a cane, one foot in front of him on this, um, this, the, the peak of this rock that he's on. It's this big rock um, overlooking this foggy valley in front of him 
with rock outcroppings in, you know, uh, in different places in front of him. In the far distance is a large mountain and to the left of him. And then to the right of him, there's even a, can't remember the technical geological term for it, but a, another big rocky alcove. I think you see them in uh, America and like Utah, uh, like lone sentinel um, plateaus. So Kirk, if I may jump ahead here, yeah. what do you imagine him saying to himself as he's standing over here in this relaxed pose with the wind what? brushing through his he fine head of hair? <laughs> um, so I, I'm kind of, it's difficult for me because I think the Nietzsche phrase, because when I bought Nietzsche, um, the uh, his book on Nietzsche, it had this as the cover. And mm -hmm. so I think thus spoke Zarathustra, but I, you know, like the, the Ubermensch type thing, like the, the strong man, you know, in control of the world, like this is my world. This is like Howard Something Rourke like at that. the top, yeah. you know, Howard Rourke laughed if you know the fountainhead. And, and it's got that feel of this is, my, you know, overlooking my land. It's, it's Simba, right. Kind <laughs> of coming to the Lion King. And it's like uh, everywhere like that, that the, the, yeah. the, uh, everywhere that you can see is, and everywhere the sun touches is yours. Right. That, and that's, that's the feeling this has. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So somebody looking over their, their dominion, their world, maybe contemplating, um, contemplating greater questions in life. Yes, yes, the, the big, deep philosophical questions. Yeah, now, and, and I could see I've a got difference. Both similarity. of them just side by side here. So, yeah. Kirk, what would you say is the difference between these two characters? He's definitely more confident in his approach. Right? Like, it's, if, if we're going to take the Lion King, there's the Lion King moment when the little Simba's like a little pub pup or whatever and he had <laughs> pup. i need a drink i've been, slip. I've been uh, uh trapped in here for too long someone get me a pub Simba and a pub. he's a little <laughs> yeah. young at that he point. Like, yeah, yeah. but yeah like he's like a little pup and he's crawling toward the edge and he's looking over and he's scared to like help his father to you know do that because he's he's afraid so he's, he's not quite ready whereas when he's you know the king of everything and he's he's defeated um mufasa then he is like, you know, puts his paw up and he like roars, right? And that's kind of the difference is you have innocence and experience. You have immaturity and maturity. You have the beginning stages of exploration and, you know, achievement and, you know, ability and competence. And, you know, I, I've earned it. I'm here. I've arrived. All right. So you're describing, you're describing kind of um, the characters and having two different times in their life that that man from the Caspar David Friedrich painting is is matured and he's thinking about okay my relationship to the world and mm. my ability in it my confidence in it and she is come up to this place maybe a little bit on the dare it's much more precarious than that uh, that gentleman's the foppish gentleman's the dapper gentleman's a point mm -hmm. out. This is more to have a little bit of a thrill. Yeah. So I I've got another follow up for question for this one, uh, which is after she comes down, how is she going to feel about what she just experienced, where that wind just gusted at her? Is she going to say, "Oh my God, I'm never going to do that again," or is she going to say, "Oh my God, what a thrill"? Ooh, I mean that I would probably lean toward the thrill one for this character. Like because Why do you she, say that? just because she she doesn't have the attitude of although she's scared, it's not the attitude of someone who is so terrified that they make a mistake and like fall or get hurt, right? Like they like something unexpected happens and some people freak out and they can't handle it. Right? That's true. And yeah. some people like you know, like this young lady, she is scared, but she braces and she doesn't, you know, freak out. She doesn't like throw her hands up. She doesn't, she's not screaming. She's not, you know, whatever, uh, uh, you know, laying down or, or trying to grip the rock and say, get me out of here. She's, you know, pushing her so dress down. Part of it is the, the reaction back. that she has when the, the wind blows suggests that she's got a little bit of courage and maybe she treats it as a thrill. I've got another thought too. Can I tell you? 
a little bit of my fear, Kirk. Yeah. Uh, your fear is of being okay. my fear. My fear is that I being where she is right now. Oh. I would never ever yeah. be at that place where she is right now. Yeah. You would not find me standing where she is. Not now, not when I was a kid, not ever. For sure. I would freak out. Yeah. So just that she she wants to go up there not because she's contemplating the, her life or the world or that she's uh that there's there's a she's climbing over the mountain. It's just that she wants to. Yeah. I'm sorry. There are the things I'd rather be doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. That, no, that's a really good point. It makes me think of a time I um, was a teacher and I did summer, a summer thing with uh, Laporte, uh, the a school that I taught at, and we went to Yosemite. And there's this one, I don't remember the name of the place, but there's this one place where you can crawl on your belly to the edge and look down. And it's like a straight drop down. Like it's, and I couldn't do it. All the kids could do it. And I just, I was like, I'm terrified of heights. <laughs> I, I'm just really a chicken. And that, like, so I totally get that feeling of like, this is not necessary. <laughs> like, I have other things in life to do. This is not, this is not what I'm going to be doing with my time right now. Um, so I, I totally understand that there's a element of thrill and maybe even bravery, physical bravery that she has. That is um, that isn't as clear in the Casper Friedrich one um, because he's not really in any kind of mortal danger. Like I could probably do what he did, yeah. Right, because yeah. there's still several inches before the the edge, and really more than that. Like he could fall forward and probably be okay. Um, whereas she is like on. It's because you know for those who haven't seen it yet and just listened, it's not just a mountain with like a plateau. It's a mountain with a like a, a peak that actually is very you know maybe i could imagine based on her size it's like less than a foot in um diameter or something across right like it's very small space it for her looks like she's got her feet nestled in there in a crack in the rock yeah and she takes one step to the left she falls she takes one step to the right she falls one step forward so, she falls yeah yeah there's not much space there. So do you want to hear the title of this artwork? Please. And I think maybe the title might help answer the question of whether or not she's expecting this and she she's going to come down or not. So the title of this artwork that is on the plaque at the uh, Fry Museum of Art in Seattle. So this is the second artwork from the Fry Museum of Art in Seattle. All right, Fry. Uh, we got to go visit that. Um, it's called In the Fane Wind. In the Fane Wind. Fane. Like F E I N? Fane. So it's F O umlaut, uh, with the two dots, H N. And the Fane Wind is a particular kind of wind in a particular region of the Alps. Oh. In the Tyrol region. And the Tyrol region is in Austria and northern Italy. And the artist, Matthias Schmidt, I think he was from that area. He did a lot of these. Um, peasant women from uh, in in the Alps in the Tyrol area, and the Fane wind is something that hikers know about, that everybody knows about, and my suspicion is maybe that this girl knows about the Fane wind, and she knows that if she gets up high, there's that wind that's going to blow. Yeah. I don't know how frequently it blows or whether it comes in gusts or not. But it looks like it did come in a gust for her because her hat flies off. Yeah. But that maybe is a suggestion that, you know, it's part of the dare. It's part of what she's expecting. It's part of the thrill of being up there. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, no, I totally get that. And I, I've even read of these women. Um, I don't know, rather saw a documentary years ago of these women who were mountain climbers, like in the 1900s and, and 1800s. And, you know, you, they have pictures I of this. I can't believe you're talking about the 1900s as if it's a, a past century. Well, I mean, like like early 1900s, <laughs> like like late 1800s. Yeah, you're right. Good point. Uh, I mean, it is it oh, is a man. long time ago, man. It's, oh, wow. But like there's the, I see, I can picture these, these uh, women in their dresses, like in a dress, like climbing freehand, uh, like scaling a wall, uh, scaling a, a mountain side. And it's really intense. And it's like, there, there was this whole class of, you know, female that did this. And I just thought that was interesting. And, and when I saw this girl, I kind of got that picture of, 
And when you were talking about it in particular, I got this picture of she's going to be one of those women or she is those, you know, that, that person already, or she's training to be it. And so, yeah, it's interesting that you chose this for childhood wildness. Well, I, here's what I'm asking why yeah. I picked up the childhood wildness yeah. part, because you described, uh, you know, a moment where you would not go up to the edge to take a look, but yeah. I'm curious. I was an adult, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. As an adult. But as a kid, do you remember any times where, and I think this is the key moment, the key kind of situation that she's experiencing here, where you you kind of tested the boundaries of your fear of what is out there in nature, of the wildness of nature, to get a a, an, mm. a bit of an experience of it. Um, and while you're thinking, if you'd like, I'll share I'll share a couple examples yeah. from, you, from you start, my childhood. Yeah, please. Yeah. So one example for me is um, I did a lot of scuba fishing, and mm. uh, well, I didn't do. My dad did, and sometimes I'd accompany him, and it would go through the reefs. And I remember one particular moment where a shark passed us by, Oof. and that moment stuck with me because it, you know we weren't in any serious danger, but there's a shark that swam, you know. 20 feet in front of us and yeah. cross, cross by that didn't, didn't diminish my desire to go and go snorkeling anymore. I, I want to do more of it. Oh really? Or, okay. And I mentioned sailboating before. Yeah. One thing that <laughs> I really liked is when the wind picked up in this, uh, on the sailboat and, um, and the, the sails are, 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 are pushing that boat forward and we're going, uh, along the waves and crashing up and down on the waves. And I'd want to go to the very front and feel the up and down. It's like a roller coaster ride a little bit. And then I have this, the, the general feeling of, of a memory of you know, happening over and over again of the, of the spray of the ocean splashing me and then coming away completely wet uh. and going back to the back of the boat after I've just got soaked that, that, that spray got me. Yeah. And I think a little bit of her right now, that fain wind got her. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been touched by this thing. Yeah, I agree. I've okay. touched and it's, it's, it's something that's, that is, um, uh, you, you're not there primarily for that. You're there for one kind of experience, but as a package mm. of that experience, there's a little bit more, there's a little bit edgier stuff along with it. I see what I'm you're not saying. expecting a huge way to crash on top of me. I'm enjoying the up and down and, and the crashing against the waves of the boat. But once in a while, the sea would throw something more than I was expecting. Interesting. And then I go back soaked. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I guess I didn't think of that way. I mean, I, I'm trying to think about times when I was a kid, I, I did, I did a lot of stupid city stuff. I'm trying to think of stuff in the, like life or death stuff in the city, um, which was really dumb, but I did for whatever reason, but in nature. So the, I have some ocean ones of like challenges to swim out farther than I probably should have. Right. And that's one where I definitely remember almost drowning at one point, partly because even though I didn't go as far as this other person that, like you said, there was a kind of, all of a sudden I found myself being dragged under a little bit. Oh man, without, that, that was, that was rough. Yeah. Like you, and you're not, you're not expecting it or something. So I, I think it's stuff like that. Um, but what about a moment where there is not as much peril there? Yeah. I'm trying, I'm trying to think. So that, that, because I have to the like really I have search from her is she is not in peril that she, she's courageous enough and, um, agile enough and strong enough to hold a position and she's expecting this and this is this is more along the lines well she lost her hat <laughs> but she's gonna enjoy you know what I got up there and lost my hat and she'll tell her that tell herself that that she went out and tested the limits of the natural world and what her boundary is with it yeah no I, I mean I understand the story like the the, mm -hmm. the sense that you're trying to do I'm just trying to rack my own yeah. childhood memory. One of the things that was interesting about this choice of topic is I don't have a ton of memories of my youth for whatever reason. Like I don't remember my childhood that much. I don't know if you've met people like that. So 
I mean, I remember snippets, I'm, but now that you're mentioning this, what I had in mind was like times I almost died or like <laughs> and almost fell off this cliff when we were hiking because I wasn't paying attention or something or, you know, stuff like that or, or um, you know, getting stung by no, a bunch that's of... That's interesting. Like, that's interesting that you're thinking of that. And I think a good comparison image to this one would be an image of, to, to capture your kind of moment that you're describing, would be somebody who looks like they're in peril, would be somebody who's yeah. unbalanced or yeah. clinging to the cliff, but she's neither she's of those. not, yeah. She's so she racing. was going for one experience and then she got another. I'm going to have to like rack my brain because I know it's happened. You know, I know there's been times we used to do cross country trips and we'd go all over the place, um, all over America and, and, you know, uh, particular. And I know there's times and, and then lots of ocean adventures yeah. now. Uh, so and I'd just to build one thing that you said there that she went for one experience and got another, I think I would say it more like she went for one experience and got the extreme version of it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Cause she's expecting this. Like kind you. of, like you, uh, so here's, there's a, a terrifying YouTube video of a old lady skydiving and have, have you seen this? No, I haven't. So I, I'm a, I'm a weirdo. I like to see the, like the most terrifying experiences that can happen in any particular choice that you're going to make. So like I watch, you know, motorcycle rides that, that uh, like on YouTube that end really bad because I ride motorcycle. And for me, this is like, um, training for, for me to be aware when I'm on the motorcycle. So I don't get lax. Right. But anyway, so what you're saying about this extreme version of it makes what happened with this lady is horrifying. If you watch the video, she, um, they, they, I don't know if I want to hear about yeah, this. They, she, she's okay, by the way, she's okay. Just okay. so you know. Um, but, but what it is still horrifying to watch. Like what happens is, you know, she kind of resists that the first, but that always happens where people like don't want to go out the window they are out the, out the door and they, the instructors on her back, he finally gets her out. They go. But what happened was one of her straps broke in the resistance. And so, um, she's holding on her shirt is flipped over cause she's now flipped on her back the other way. And he, the, the instructor's like for dear life, trying to hold on to her. And she's, they're plummeting to the earth as this is happening. You could see like her skin is like being rippled by the, the uh, the the wind and then he holds on luckily and then the parachute goes and he holds on the whole time, but I mean th talk about you're getting one experience of skydiving and then you get an extreme now it's again it's more dangerous than what you're talking about but um that's that for still so I'm yeah still, that sounds like something goes wrong in that experience yeah, yeah. it's it's All right, so extreme I'm, I'm, I'm that's what I'm thinking of the peril I guess so this is in the Fane Wind by Matthias Schmidt. And it's uh, at the Fry uh, in Seattle. Okay, I'm ready for the poem. Okay. Um, so the poem is called Nutting by William Wordsworth. And one thing I do want to, uh, I'm not going to set this up like usual. I want you guys just to listen and it's not going to make sense probably, and that's okay. But I want you to uh, know that when he says nutting, he means the action of um, hunting Gathering for nuts, right? ha hazelnuts, particularly. Yeah. yeah. So there's, you know, he's going to have his wallet, which the wallet is a big bag, you know, uh, picture like the homeless people with the bag. And then he's got a nutting crook, which is like a thing that you would poke up in a, tr a hazelnut tree or bush to gather nuts. So that's, that's it. But um, that's the only setup I'm going to give you. Um, and then we'll break it down afterwards. Okay, are we ready for the reading? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm All right, ready. so it's Nutting by William Wordsworth. It seems a day I speak of one from many singled out, one of those heavenly days that cannot die, when, in the eagerness of boyish hope, I left our cottage threshold, sallying forth with a huge wallet over my shoulders slung, a nutting crook in hand and turned my steps towards some far distant wood, a figure quaint, tricked out in proud disguise of cast-off weeds, which for that service had been husbanded by exhortation of my frugal dame. Motley accoutrement 
of power to smile at thorns and breaks and brambles, and, in truth, more ragged than need was. Or pathless rocks, through beds of matted fern and tangled thickets, forcing my way, I came to one dear nook unvisited, where not a broken bough drooped with its withered leaves, ungracious sign of devastation. But the hazels rose tall and erect, with tempting clusters hung, a virgin scene. A little while I stood, breathing with such suppression of the heart as joy delights in, and with wise restraint, voluptuous, fearless of a rival, eyed the banquet. Or beneath the trees I sat among the flowers, and with the flowers I played, a temper known to those who, after long and weary expectation, have been blessed with sudden happiness beyond all hope. Perhaps it was a bower beneath the, whose leaves the violets of five seasons reappear and fade, unseen by any human eye, where fairy water breaks do murmur on forever, and I saw the sparkling foam, and, with my cheek on one of those green stones that, fleeced with moss under the shady trees, lay round me, scattered like a flock of sheep. I heard the murmur, and the murmuring sound, in that sweet mood when pleasure loves to pay tribute to ease. And, of its joy secure, the heart luxuriates with indifferent things, wasting its kindliness on stalks and stones, and on the vacant air. Then up I rose, and dragged to earth both branch and bough, with crash and merciless ravage and the shady nook of hazels, and the green and mossy bower, deformed and sullied, patiently gave up their quiet being. And, unless I now confound my present feelings with the past, ere from the mutilated bower I turned, exulting, rich beyond the wealth of kings, I felt a sense of pain when I beheld the silent trees, and saw the intruding sky. Then, dearest maiden, move along these shades in gentleness of heart, with gentle hand touch, for there is a spirit in the woods. All right, all right, all right. Oh, man, okay. That was so, intense, right? <laughs> I, I find that one intense, personally. Uh, so what came to hmm. mind for you? Is this childhood wildness? So my, this is the second time that I've read it. You sent it to me beforehand. And I read it once before. And uh, so here's my quick brief summary. Um, a boy goes out looking for um, hazelnuts, and he stumbles upon this perfect little place where, where it's, it's just um, – what's that, that, that word that uh, – oh, it's pastoral. A pastoral little Perfect place, yeah. and he he's just kind of enjoys it. Then he gets these nuts, and that's it. So it's almost like just a relaxation of childhood when you're out away from everything, when you go out into nature, when you go out into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, <laughs> There's this one, the last portion that I I didn't get as thrown in there when he talks about then, dearest maiden, move along these shades in gentleness of heart with gentle hand touch for there's a spirit in the woods. And it started making me think that maybe this pastoral little place, this, what do you call it, this virgin place is a metaphor but, and so I started seeing a lot of things with a little bit of a double entendre. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me ask you um, one question to start you, because um, you are you have um, the general summary, but let me ask you, who is the speaker of this entire poem? Who's talking? All right. 
So it sounds like it's it's this guy um, looking back at his childhood. It seems a day I speak of one from there many singled out. Yeah, and notice, so he's remembering childhood. Now, if you're listening, you're not watching. This is very important that the first line of this poem is indented all the way to the right, and there's a big M dash, right? Now, do, does that have an impression on? Uh, you just said what it was, basically. Is it, it's kind of like he's coming out of this, um, thought, right? So it, and he, you're right. He's thinking about his childhood. Absolutely. All right. So he's thinking about the times he would constantly go and, and gather nuts, but there was one particular day and now that he went and I, I, there's one part towards the beginning where he talks about, we're speaking about, you know, about uh, the women in his life or the spirit of a woman being in the nature. There's a, the other woman. And I'm going to read this part right here. It says, uh, tricked out in proud disguise of cast off weeds, which for that service had been husbanded by exhortation of my frugal dame. Yes. What is, so that was actually one of so the questions dame, I have. Who's a dame? Yeah. Do you know the definition of a dame? Does that a dame is a woman? Right. Yes, but it's something very particular. So this is one of those times when a dictionary is absolutely necessary. So a dame. Mother? Is it his mother? So I think you could take that literally, but there's a very important tone that he's trying to capture with the words sallying forth, a huge wallet on my shoulder, you know, and he's with accoutrements and exhortation of my frugal dame and motley, like a motley crew and you know, and he's got this, um, this, this attire that he's doing. Now, let me give you the definition of dame. This is one that is really helpful to um, know. And I wrote it down and can't find it, but I know what it is basically. A dame is essentially the female word for a knight. That's what the dame literally means. That's what you, oh, here we go. Title given to a woman equivalent to the rank of a knight. Okay, so was, is this suggesting that he is kind of a well-to-do kid, but... He goes off in nature wearing uh, motley garments, ragged, and just because he he enjoys kind of let me let me get out of my stuffy clothes, let me go into something more comfortable. Well, what? And he goes off into nature, and his and his mom lets him do that or encourages him to do that. His mom says, "Go, latchkey kid, get out of here." Go, latchkey kid. <laughs> uh, well, this yeah, this is. Uh... Not a new, new child. This isn't modern children. So yeah, I think all kids were probably somewhat latchkey back, back at this point. But, but what makes you think that he's wealthy? Well, if you're talking about a dame, that's the title of a, of a woman. And in fact, he's got these frugal clothes on all tricked out and okay. disguised of cast off weeds. Okay. I guess, I guess that's one way. I, so to me, I, I feel like the, the the word dame, whether she's actually literally a dame or it's he's just calling her that, because the other things is is he's tricked out in proud disguise of cast off weeds that have been husbanded, and she's a frugal dame. She's not a wealthy dame, right? The adjective is frugal. So I you know I get the impression that maybe they're not like dirt poor, but they're not super wealthy. Yeah, I, 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 that doesn't seem too important, right? He's, he's a kid. He's going off. And yes. so then the place that he finds, this virgin scene. So can I read that portion again? Just, okay. Yes. So, but the hazels rose tall and erect with tempting cluster hung a virgin scene. A little while I stood breathing with such suppression of the heart as joy delights in. And with wise restraint, voluptuous, fearless of a rival, Eyed the banquet. Okay, so he sees all these um, these hazel trees, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> he's wondering, okay, oh wow, this is so beautiful. Nobody's touched these, and I'm wary of anybody else finding them because this is now my hoard. Why? Why do you think he's worried about that? He's fearless of a rival, so he has no oh. fear of a rival, right? So it's the opposite. I got it because he's so far into the the forest. Okay, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's kind of there's uh, nobody there to bother him in this virgin wood. Yeah, so he, this is a virgin wood. No one's touched this, um, and and again, his mission. So one thing I was trying to get at with that first thing is look, think of him as a knight on a journey. So I that that's that's how I want you to think of the tone of that beginning that I wanted to get to is this is a knight. 
you know, if you know the poem by um, uh, El, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, El Dorado, gaily bedight a gallant knight and such that I want you to have that feeling for this, um, for this guy. He's this little kid. And now he's rem- you, like you said, it's a guy remembering this, that he went out with boyish hope on this journey. And the journey is exactly what you said. He's just going to go to get some hazel um, nuts. But on this journey, he finds this magical scene, this virgin scene, you know, like you're a kid and you go into, you, 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 um, you know, like Goonies or something, you find this, this magical grotto that nobody's touched. Uh, I like the comparison. Yeah. yeah. Goonies grotto. Yeah. That's good. That's yeah, exactly. Right? And so, yeah. and, and it's like, oh, wow. It's like this magical place that he's found. And, you know, the, the, if we had time to dig into the language here, it's really critical, I think, to have that tone, which he's striking. So. He's striking with with the words that I was showing you. But all right, so you're right with all yeah, no, no, so he gets there and he's he's fearless, um, and he, he's he's like, this is mine. I'm here. I've come to this place on my journey. It's magnificent. It's my own. And then, so what does he start to do there? He starts to like relax and sleep, right? Yeah. So so the question I had for you in this section when, that you just read is, um, you're you're on the right track, is. Can you name a moment when, so or what is he feeling in this moment when he found this, this magical area? Yeah, this, this excitement, this like wonder. And then have you felt that way before? Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like as a kid in particular. Uh, it might take me a moment to think of something in particular, yeah, in particular but just a, just a feeling like you described in the, in the movie. Sometimes it's easily more easily relatable to think of the movie experience that you yeah. had, but the Goonies, when you called that up, I say, yeah, I know that feeling. Yeah. Okay. So he's in this place where there's, it's happiness beyond all hope. He suddenly, you know, that's the phrase he uses is he's gotten to this place, happiness beyond all hope. And he finds this, this area, you know, with, with leaves, the violets of five seasons reappear and fade unseen by any human eye where fairy water breaks do murmur on forever. What are violets of five seasons? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I, my, the impression I get is that it's like this tuft of um, oh, so untouched. So got it. Because they, they've, it's not like five seasons, like there's an extra one added to the four. It's over the course of five years, these violets have start, have have, got, have replenished, have grown. And so that, that tuft, as you're talking about, is, is there's more and more of them, a lot of them. That's, that's what I get. And what's yeah. really interesting, and let me ask you for this next under line 29. So if you're looking at the, um, the image that I gave you, what do you think? So it goes like this. Perhaps it was a bower beneath whose leaves, the violets of five seasons reappear and fade unseen by any human eye where fairy water breaks do murmur on forever. What do you think is the importance of the word? Perhaps. Why do you think he says perhaps it was a bower? Does that bring anything to your mind? Well, he's, he's calling back um, one of many different, um, instances of this going off on this journey to uh, to go find hazelnuts. And he's kind of, com- I'm guessing he's combining a lot of these experiences into a retelling of what it was yeah. like to do that. And I think that's important because he's shading this whole thing. He's telling this, it's an, a grown man, let's say, telling this to, we find out later, a maiden. And, you know, just like when I'm trying to think of a, I'm telling you a story, I'm like, well, maybe I was on a rock. No, actually I was on a dirt path. Wait, you know, so he's, he's kind of remembering these things. Right. And then what about this, this whole thing with, with my cheek on one of those green stones that fleeced with moss under the shady trees lay around me scattered like a flock of sheep. You used a word, but what kind of feeling comes about from this scene and and these words in your mind? Oh, tired. Uh, Wait, why peaceful tired? relaxation. That's it. Okay, that's what I was going for. Yeah, I was curious why tired, but definitely peaceful, quaint, relaxed. He's at he's at a state of peace for this little boy. He's like, wow, this this is a beautiful scene. And then I heard the murmur and the murmuring sound in that sweet mood when pleasure loves to pay tribute to ease. Now I just think this is kind of him exploring the um feeling of that little boy that he's and you even noticed, like, I think you pointed this out. The word voluptuous is in there and you might think of like a double entendre. Maybe there is a double entendre that we learned, but voluptuous means characterized by luxury or sensual pleasure. 
So it's a very sensual scene that this little boy is walking into. All right. So he's there in the central little place um, and peaceful, tranquil, pastoral, uh, enjoying those five seasons of, of flowers there. And then he gets up and he tears down the branches of those, of those hazelnut trees in order to get to the bounty. Now, he doesn't just tear down. What does he say? Okay, then up I rose and dragged to earth both branch and bough with crash and merciless ravage. Yeah, so, so what does that bring to mind? Like, what did he do? I No, I don't know what you're going for there. So he, it's not, it's one thing to kind of use your nutting crook and, and get the things you want, but he, and he like ripped this thing yeah, down. Yeah, he's tearing them down, right? With merciless ravage, yeah. right? Yeah. And so it's a kind of rage. It's a kind of fury. Now, what just what were we just talking about? What was the scene that he was looking of course, at? It was all quiet. And it was now calm it's, it's very intense and peaceful. And then all okay. of a sudden, and if you listen to the language, and there's a lot of analysis of this language, there's there's a shift in the tone, like the heart. You get these uh, multisyllabic um, words. The heart luxuriates within different things, wasting its kindliness on stocks and stones, and on the vacant air. Then up I rose, right? Mon it's just all of a sudden very quick and out of nowhere. Then up I rose and dragged to earth both branch and bough with crash and merciless ravage. Now, why does he do this? What, what evidence do we have in here of what caused him to do this? Why does he do what exactly? The ravaging this place. Why does he tear it apart? Why does this kid tear this place apart. Well, is it, he wants the nuts. Is that it? Is that, is, but is that the way to get the nuts? What, like the heart luxuriates with, you know, he's luxuriating here. It's this vacant, calm air. It's just him. And then up I rose and dragged to earth, both branch and bow with crap. Like what? This is a boy. Why did he do that? Is it, I don't, is there something in the poem that you're seeing Kirk that's suggesting why he did it? The, the thing that is suggested is that there is no reason except that he's a boy. He just did it. It's impulsive. So where it's is that nowhere. suggested? Because it's wasting its, it's this, it goes from one moment of calm, wasting its kindliness on stocks and stones, kindliness. And on the vacant air, there's, then up I rose, then out of nowhere, he rises up, just boom, and tears everything down. And anybody who's dealt with little boys, I think, has seen this kind of behavior. <laughs> At least I have where they're just kind of calm one moment and the next moment they just knock stuff over. And I know as a boy, I definitely had that kind of rage just out of, or that, that impestuous nature in me, right? Where I just kind of would do that. And the, so this, this sequence right here is really critical to think about that it's coming out of nowhere. Then up I rose. Why? And he's telling this to um, this, this young maiden. What? All right, so, so I want to yeah. read this part right here that I think is particularly relevant that you've been talking about a little bit, Kirk. So this sudden transition. Then up I rose and dragged to earth both branch and bough with crash and merciless ravage and the shady nook of hazels and the green and mossy bower deformed and sullied patiently gave up their quiet being. Yes. And unless I now confound my present feelings with the past, air from the mutilated bower, I turned exulting. Yeah, I just, I did that. I just tore all that stuff up. Uh, rich beyond the wealth of kings, rich in the, the nuts that he's gathered, I felt a sense of pain when I beheld the silent trees and saw the intruding sky. Okay, so that's that's the question I have right here. When he says, I felt a sense of pain when I beheld the silent trees and saw the intruding sky, what are the silent trees and what is this intruding sky? Is is that intruding sky there because he's torn down branches and he's seen the wreck that he's caused? I think, yeah, I think you got on the exact thing I was going to ask you. Yeah. Is, um, so try to imagine there's a couple levels. I think you have to imagine one that, he says, unless I now confound my feelings, present feelings with the past. So he's kind of, this adult person is kind of maybe shading his past thinking, 
But in the moment of that child, the child tear, tore down this pristine, beautiful, perfect thing. And before, you know, he says, heir from the mutilated. So before the mutilated bower, the, the shade, right? That, that's a, the bower means a shade provided by this tree. I turned exulting. So before I turned exulting, rich beyond the wealth of kings, before that moment, I felt a sense of pain. So right when he did that, as a kid, unless okay, of that's course, important. yeah, unless of so course he's just confounding I, I've seen it. it. Yeah, it's not it's not the feeling of pain after he's um, felt grand. It's he feels pain first, so and he, then feels grand. And okay, he, yeah, and he wants to know why he did this, right? I think he wants wait, to kind wait, of wait, wait, where, oh, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Oh, I don't see that. Why does he want to know why he did it? Well, I felt a sense of pain when I beheld the silent trees and saw the intruding sky. Okay, so so forget that for a second. So I, I want you're right to focus on the silent trees and intruding sky. I think that's great because who one? Why would the sky be intruding in this moment? How how did it become intruding? What action? Oh, happened? these are the uh, these are the eyes of others. This is yeah. this is this is the world that's outside who can now see him and yes. his little pastoral bower. You got it. The spirit in the woods, right? So his activity, his, what he did caused now the sun and the sky and the all earth could see his, I'm going to use a word. Well, actually, let me ask you if it comes to your mind. Maybe it doesn't, but does this, what he did, like tearing this down, sullying, deforming to get his wealth. Does a word come to mind of the kind of action that humans might do in nature for that? Ravage? Ravage or rapacious, right? So I think ravage is a good word. Rapacious is another one where it's like, I'm going to tear this down in order to get what I want. Does all that, right. Does that yeah, so, resonate at all? So the big question then, okay, what do the last three lines help to do? Okay. The last lines help to shed any meaning on why he does it and whether or not this is, is the poem is capturing that this is a typical boy response to something. So the last three lines are, then dearest maiden, move along these shades and gentleness of heart with gentle hand touch for there is a spirit in the woods. So m my first impression of that Kirk is maybe he's talking to his daughter and he's mm. saying to her, okay, don't do like I, I did when I was a kid and tear things up. Move along these shades and gentleness of heart with gentle hand touch for there's a spirit in the woods. So yep. be very careful. Treat nature and its beauty with, with kindness, with a soft touch and don't ravage it like I did. In um, fables, what, what might we call this? If there's a fable... And, you know, like Aesop's fable and they do this story and then at the end they have a moral, right? So this might be like the moral of the story. So what is the moral? I think you said it. You're right. Well, uh, so don't touch nature? Not don't just don't. Free. That's not what you said. You said be gentle with nature. Be gentle with nature. Yeah. So, okay. So if you're going to get what you want, you know, if, you, if you're going to get those hazelnuts, be gentle. Now, in terms of his inner motivation, the reason I, well, I mean, before I, do you want me to go into why I chose the poem? Well, all right. So or let me just get a sense thoughts? of, a, I, yeah, I think I've got a sense. Let me capture what I think the is going on here. My, my last summary of okay, this. Okay, please do. So he's talking to his daughter and telling her, you know what? I go out in nature all the time and um, I, I, I got ready and it was a big journey and, and, oh, I found this absolutely beautiful place where I just settled in and relaxed, enjoyed it, and it was tranquility. And then I tore down all the branches and picked up all the hazelnuts and had a bounty, but I did have this moment of pain when I looked around the silence around me and what I had done. So, daughter, don't do what I did when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that it's, um, 
it, it may not be so simple as just don't do it. It may just be. It's more positive. It's more like um, enjoy nature, but treat it respectfully, reverently. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I think the treat it reverently nature is important and, you know, beautiful and to um, rip it apart like that is to harm it in a sense. All right. So Kirk, why did you pick this poem? Well, the, for childhood wildness, childhood wildness, right? Well, yeah. for one, I mean, if you, uh, you know, draw a picture of this boy as he goes out, he's a knight is the, the, kind of tone that I was trying to explain. And one other thing I just want to mention is this is done in something called Mil Miltonic blank verse. So it's something we don't understand anymore, but at the time, this is the verse of Epic. So this is what you would do with like a grand knight going on a journey. That's what he is capturing. Um, now again, today we don't really get that as much in the, in the tone. I don't know about you, but I, I go out on grand journeys as a knight. Yeah. Pretty frequently. Yeah, I think we do, but I I don't think we have so like the the sound that I get is like dun da 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 this boy going out dun da 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 dun dun da, but and he puts on his brambles like he adds brambles like that's his armor right and he's got cast off weeds that his um, that his dame gave to him or really that that's so this is him shading his youth in that kind of feeling and it's like when you know if I were to look back at oh I, I played soldier. As a kid, and I, I went on these grand soldiers. Really, I just threw tan bark at my friends and we pretended, right? Like that was it. And that that was so that's the kind of tone that he's capturing is like this epic war journey. And he goes out. And then so, you know, I picture this wild boy. He's he's brambles in his hair, you know, it's it's this crazy kid going out there by himself with his crook in his hand. Oh, so, yeah. Just like a yeah. lance, you yeah. know, you know, going out there. And then for me, the pivotal thing that I think is so critical is that then up I rose and, and did this thing and that it's, it's played as so inexplicable. And I think there is something, you know, like I can think of times when I was a kid, especially that for some reason, I just got, I just pushed this kid or I just like, sh like, you know, I'm thinking I'm like when I'm really young, maybe five, six, seven, even where you know, pulled someone's hair for no real, they didn't really do much to me. Or I just, I, I, um, when I was a kid, I, <laughs> this is embarrassing. When I'm really little, I broke all the tips off of my parents' knives. I, I stabbed it in this oak and broke them off. No reason. And you know, I was like four five, six years old. So I was a little younger than this mm -hmm. kid probably, but still for no reason I did that. Um, you know, they're, they're definitely going out and just kind of like, Oh, uh, I remember I played darts, by throwing it up in the air above me and moving like just stupid tempestuous. Like, why not? Like, I'm just going to put this here and throw these darts in the air. I know it's stupid. I'm going to, you know, it's like jumping off a roof cause well, I could do it. And it, no, I remember a couple of times I, once I, I spit off the balcony of a three story apartment and, and hit somebody at the bottom on purpose. Uh, no, I didn't No, Just, it was just spitting and accidentally. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then another time I, um, Oh, I deflated somebody's tire. Yeah. Uh, bike tire. So kind of these, these moments of, of is, is this what you're describing? Kind of getting yourself into trouble with something or trying something out that is, uh, is testing the limits of goodness. So I wouldn't, I mean, that's one way to think about it. I guess I, I would think of it as, as kids, especially, and I believe as boys that there, this is more than in girls. Now I'm not a girl. I can't give them that credit. I don't know. You know, that's for them to say yes or no. I do believe there is a, for whatever reason, cultural, biological, more of a destructive like nature in our youth where it's like, you know, I I've seen this in class where like a boy will grab a pencil and break someone else's pencil and break it. Whether they, they even their friends pencils, this isn't someone they don't like just to do it. Right. And, All right. And there's kind of that, that like, um, Louis CK has this joke, uh, called boys and girls. And I'm not going to go into it cause it's really Louis CK raunchy and bad, but he gives this example where, um, you know, like this mother has been dealing with her boy all day and she's, 
you know, she's like in an army blanket because it's just been chaos all day. And she's having a drink with her friend and this little boy, there's no sand in the house anywhere. And he has somehow a handful of sand and he just throws it in her drink. Right. And <laughs> for no reason, just because, and the, uh, now girls don't do that with, you know, he gives an example of the difference between girls and boys, but you know, that kind of destructiveness I think is more innate in boys where it's like, I built a sand, a girl builds a sand castle. For right, some so reason, it, a boy just smashes it. I think I, I get the idea there. Now, I would say that there are there are two things when looking at this poem. One is to look at your personal experience and to interpret the poem through your understanding and experience. And the other one is to look at the poem and to see what's in the poem. So there's one question that I would ask regarding that interpretation of why the boy uh, gets up and um, and breaks the bowels. And that is, why is the narrator yeah. telling this story of what not to do to his daughter? Well, um, as a, one, I don't think it's... I With the implication being that he's cautioning her not to act like this, suggesting that she could act like this. That's one way to think about it. Or another way to think about it is he's warning her that this is something that boys do. Um, but he's, he's telling people in general to be um, respectful of the woods and not to do this. Yes. So I agree with you that he's telling people not to do this. And I think he's telling his daughter, especially then dearest maiden move along these shades and gentleness of heart. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not, so I, I won't say that. <laughs> I don't know if maybe he's saying that girls, if, if what you're trying to imply is that he's saying this to girls because he thinks girls do this. No, I think he's, I, I think what I'm suggesting is that there is, I don't know that there is a, an, the explanation for why the boy does this is because he's a boy. I don't see what supports it in the poem. And well, in fact, I see that he's talking to his daughter. Well, okay. So as, first off, he's talking to a virgin. That's what a maiden is. So he's talking to a virgin. So the daughter thing is what you're bringing into it. Okay. It yeah, could so, be his yeah. daughter. It's, but it's a virgin like the virgin scene that we so, just saw. No, was the, the, important part, part the important part is it's a woman. It's a, a female. If it were a boy that he's talking to, I could see it maybe leaning more towards this is he's counseling. Be careful of boy behavior. I think we're going to, I think there's many ways to read this. We're, we could go on and on because so here's my final take. I think yeah. he's if one, I think he's doing this for the reader to have a moral at the end Two, if you want to take the internal look at this poem, he's telling it to the maiden as a cautionary tale about how boys are because she is, you know, like there's a comparison between the virgin scene and her as a virgin. So like this, that's another way to look at it. Now, I, I maybe, will be very interested to hear. Maybe we should ask our uh, audience yeah. on Facebook. What do they so see? What do you think is the the narrator of this poem going for? Is this a poem that is cautioning um, boy behavior, or is this a poem that is cautioning general connection to nature and being kind to nature? Uh, it's a mangled, but that's the gist of it. Yeah. So. What How do you, do you compare see the, this idea of the <laughs> poem, this poem to the painting? Let me recall the painting. So that that's a, that's a really interesting because I think they're really different. Um, the painting is that girl standing on the cliff very bravely, and she's uh, what is it? The Fain wind, and yeah. the way you phrased it that I liked was she went for one experience and got another one. So I see both of these children like got, got or got the experience more intensely, as you put it than she expected. Um, so I see the, the boy, you know, is going out on a journey himself, just like she went out on a journey on the, in the painting. So she went on a journey, not as, not a long journey with a, you know, horses, but she went on a journey of climbing this cliff and getting to that spot and experiencing that experience. And this boy went on a journey to go get some hazelnuts. And I think that is where I'm seeing the, probably the similarities stop. Um, she, you know, she's wild in the sense that she's brave. 
She has courage to get up on this thing just to have a thrill. This boy is wild because he is like an animal, like a rampaging animal for a moment, right? Like he's going on this journey to get some hazelnuts. And then all of a sudden, like a, a rampaging animal, he just starts tearing stuff down. You know, like, like a, a boar just let loose and just what, you know, chomping at the bit for whatever reason. And even boars don't really act like that usually, but they can like run through this scene and destroy stuff like a bull in a china at the chop. That's kind of what he was like as a bull in a china shop. So that's one f- kind of wildness. And again, hers is like a very brave, fem- you know, I'll call it a feminine wildness is, is um, you know, she's up there, you know, trying to experience something to feel something. And she does. And she gets a double feeling of it. Whereas he, he goes out to get something to get these hazelnuts, this, this money, you could think of it as you know, a metaphor for money. And then he gets something else or, or then he, he um, experiences this. Inner yeah. That, that's the I, best I, think, I can I think, compare. What do you so, think? I, I don't know that I'd call it a feminine wildness at all because. I know you don't agree with that. <laughs> it, these, I'm thinking of all my experiences um, that match with hers. And, um, and so I like your kind of summation of the, of the two. They're both kind of going out and, and in experiencing something outside of the world and experiencing nature and what it has to offer, the wilderness. And one experiences the, the serenity and it goes for that and then, and then does something. New. The other one wants to find the excitement of it, wants to, to test the limits of the excitement of it. And the the poem is focusing more on the nostalgia of of having that pastoral moment and preserving that pastoral feeling. And nature is something beautiful, revered. Go and be at peace with it. Hmm. Painting is one of nature can be dangerous, can be frightening, can be scary. But you know what? You don't have to be scared of it. In fact, go and try it out. Go experience a little bit of that thrill that comes from being face to face with the danger of nature. And that's what you think of the childhood wildness is yeah. facing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, it's interesting because we're going to have different looks at it because of our different interpretations of the poem. Um, yeah. Cause I think there's, there's definitely something there with the, the different respect and look at nature. So they, the, you're saying the poem is the focus on this moral of treat nature pristinely. And no, keep it pristine. not even the moral, but primarily the experience, a different kind of experience of nature, an experience where it's peaceful and tranquil and the sunlight's coming through the trees and the violets are blooming for five seasons. And that's one kind of experience you can have with nature. And the painting focuses on a different kind of experience you can have with nature. Hmm. Man, this is tough because I think we do still have pretty different interpretations of that poem. Um, so I'll be very curious to yeah, see I what, hear the what people say. <laughs> what your interpretation of the let's sum up real quick. Is. So your let's sum up our different views so people have something to comment on on this poem. So your view, if I understand it correctly, is that it's about the experience in nature, the poem is about the experience in nature of um, keeping it, or experiencing nature as a peaceful, pristine thing. That's the experience. Yeah, when you go out to the park one day and just sit after you've gone on a long motorcycle ride, maybe in the mountains, and just sit and enjoy and have a picnic and drink some wine there and have some cheese, and you're just sitting back enjoying a quiet solitude of nature. Hmm. That's one experience of it. And then the painting is this experience of experience. This is you going on your motorcycle to the top of this mountain, going to the most treacherous <laughs> drive you can and zooming around those, yeah. uh, those roadsides, those roads on the sides of cliffs. Feeling the thrill. Mm-hmm. And I guess my uh, interpretation of the poem would be more along the lines of the narrator's, understanding of this moment and this, this, this boy in nature as a uh, consciousness 
in terms of his rapacious nature of these young boys in this case and in this of him and a kind of clarion call to be cautious against it. That's what I'm saying more. All right. Great. So <laughs> I'm excited to see. Oh, <laughs> we have, oh yeah. So I, I'm I excited it. to see what Facebook group is going to say and yeah. uh, what, what are our topics for next time or the suggested topics for next time that uh, everybody gets to vote on. Yeah. So thank you everybody. Remember to go to the Facebook group surprised by art and if you're not a member, just request it and you will get to be a member. Um, the first topic we're going to have is reverence for a mentor. Reverence for a mentor. Mm. The second mm -hmm. one is the glory of art. So that'll be a fun one. <laughs> for, <laughs> like, okay. I'm just going to just show any painting and that, there you go. That's the glory of art. There you yeah, go. Yeah. And the third one is breaking point. Breaking All right. point. Oh man, this is three different kinds of experiences. I guess the first two are kind of similar. It's both kind of admiration. Uh, one for somebody I care about that's helped me through life. All right. The second for why I love art so much. And the third one, breaking point. Oh man, <laughs> I think we've had a lot of breaking points in the past. Well, this boy months, had so. a breaking point. <laughs> for whatever reason, he broke. <laughs> Just, childhood breaking point this peaceful scene broke his soul and he had to break it apart for whatever reason yeah <laughs> all right kirk yeah, this man. was fun that was awesome uh, thank you and uh looking forward to uh to next time all right see you next time